empires all have a half-life, right? And the UK empire had a good run. And then we had the US empire. You know, the, the US peaked uh, relative to other countries 34 years ago. And now, you know, we're really on the downhill and China's massively ascending. And, you know, in my view, coronavirus, a pandemic is just accelerating uh, dramatically, I think, what was already happening. And so, you know, the U.S. is dollars uh, place as, you know, the world's currency. Um, You know, its days are numbered. are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Your crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another amazing guest, Lou Kerner, a crypto evangelist, a mentor, advisor, serial entrepreneur, and a visionary who kicked off a social media network even before MySpace that reached up to 23 million kids joining. So it's always good to have people with such a vision. And thank you so much for coming on the show, Lou. Hey, Alex. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Lou, very first question I must ask you, you had that vision about the whole social media network before it became a thing. Now you have a vision for cryptocurrency as a new asset class. But can you tell us a little bit about that personal story? Because that must have been really, really cool. Uh, Sure. Well, uh, I got involved with this company called Bolt in 2003. It had actually been started in 1996. Um, And the VCs had poured more than $50 million into it back in the internet bubble days. Uh, And in 2003, the site was kind of broken. It had about a half million kids. But the kids who were there were highly engaged. And so my view was, and the site was kind of broken, if we could rebuild the site and it worked, uh, that uh, we could build an audience. So we rebuilt it um, and it worked. And we started scaling um, uh, at our, we made eight acquisitions uh, over the course of three years. I talked to more than 100 generally 16 to 18 year old kids about buying their sites because they were great at building websites that other kids liked, um, but not so great at monetizing it. We were great at monetizing it. Uh, one of the kids that I talked to about buying his site was Mark Zuckerberg about a month after he launched Facebook. Uh, at, at that time, it was called The Facebook. At, uh, at, at Harvard, I was the first person to call him. Um, and what I really learned from that experience of running Bolt and peaking at 23 million kids is the importance of community. Um, and when I saw the crypto light uh, in, on June 29th, 2017, um, you know, I think that crypto is really infinite. I think it's the biggest thing to happen in the history of mankind. And I think that when everybody sees the crypto light, everybody sees something different based on the prism that they're looking at the world through. And so when I saw the crypto light, you know, I saw at the center of everything, I saw a community. And that's why I've spent, um, you know, the majority of my time in, in crypto uh, helping to build communities, uh, including my own communities, most notably Crypto Mondays, which is one of the biggest crypto meetups in the world, uh, active in more than 50 cities. Congratulations for being so involved with the community. And we definitely see eye to eye here because something that it is really a part of my personal values as well. So it's great to see you doing so much work behind the scenes. And so far, like I've been following yeah, you. Know, by the way, thank you yeah. for all the work you're doing for the community, right? This is great what you guys are doing. I uh, really appreciate it. It means a lot. It really means a lot. Uh, I would love to ask you a question. I've been, I was looking at your LinkedIn the other day. And obviously, you know, the big topic as of today is DeFi. And you wrote a really cool article on this. We'll put a link in the comment section below. But uh, could you tell us a little more about what you're writing about? What are you seeing these days? Sure. So, uh, you know, I 
what I have tend to focus on is what's doing this, what's going up and to the right, and and why is it doing that, and and is it going to continue? Uh, so last year, uh, you know, uh, uh, crypto speculation really in Asia was the thing that was going like that. So I was in Asia four times last year, uh, including uh, uh, Crypto Monday Shanghai twice, uh, which is awesome. And the thing after that that I really saw starting to take off late last year was DeFi. Um, and I actually wrote, you know, CoinDesk had a you know, year in review. And I wrote, you know, I, I really think when we look back at two, 2019, we're going to see how we set the table for the boom of DeFi in 2020. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, and I just wrote a post last week saying that DeFi is crypto's Netscape moment. What I mean by that is that, you know, in, in 1995, uh, Netscape released its browser. And up to that point, uh, there were literally 600 websites. Um, uh, uh, three months later, uh, the Netscape browser had 75% market share and there were more than 10,000 websites. And a few months after that, Netscape went public. And when they were only 16 months old at a $2.9 billion valuation, and back in 94, 95, that was an incredible. And that really kickstarted a five-year massive bull market. And I really believe that what we're seeing in DeFi right now is is that Netscape moment in that this is going to be the thing that that when we look back in 10 years, we're going to say that's when mass adoption really started. And this is also going to kick off another massive bull market. And we're already starting to see the start of it. But man, we haven't seen anything yet. That's really well put. I love the analogy. It's so easy to understand, Lou. And I would love to ask you just a few minutes before the interview, we were talking about potential risks in terms of DeFi, and you gave us some really cool stories about it. Um, and that's something that I believe we may not cover a lot because there are many cool topics such as yield farming, as we know, which is a huge topic these days. There's, of course, decentralized lending. There's centralized lending, earning yields. But uh, very few people cover the risk behind it. If you don't mind resharing that, because that was very, very useful. Sure. Well, look, uh, my guess is, you know, the, uh, a lot of the folks watching your show are, are sophisticated, so I'm not telling anything they don't know. But given all of the in interdependencies and given, you know, the, 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 just the nature of smart contracts, um, you know, the truth is, is that we really don't have a great appreciation for the risks involved in DeFi yet. Um, and so, you know, while the yields are, are awesome, you know, if you don't really understand what the risks are, it's hard to assess whether the yields are actually worth the risk. And undoubtedly what's going to happen, we've already seen it happen and we'll, we will continue to see it happen. Um, you know, there are going to be a lot of DeFi projects that blow up um, and, and people will lose their money. Um, and, you know, the analogy that I use is it's like the early days of, of planes in that flying planes and that there were a lot of plane crashes and every time there was a plane crash you know we'd investigate it and and try and solve so we wouldn't have that plane crash again and now today they're basically almost no more plane crashes and so that's the path that we're on to on on DeFi. it's early days um but i you know but i think it's going to just uh uh you know the world has no idea what's coming yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Andreas Antonopoulos mentioned that he was concerned about poor code, possible bugs in smart contracts. Uh, but obviously, DeFi offers transparency. A little bit earlier, you were talking about how you didn't like some parts of centralized lending where things are a little bit less transparent and we don't really know what's being done with our money. Like, what are your concerns, not on the DeFi side, but more on the centralized lending side? Well, look, the, the, the guys who are doing the centralized lending as well, right, they're taking, uh, you know, a, a control of your crypto, essentially. Uh, and, you know, there's not a lot of transparency on exactly what they're doing, exactly how they're generating uh, the, the, the interest that then they're paying back. And so, you know, there are uh, and they're also not generally very <laughs> regulated. Um, so who really knows what's going on and, and who and, and, and it's impossible again to understand what the risks are. And if you don't understand what the risks are, it's impossible for you to know if you're being compensated appropriately in, in your yield uh, for that risk. 
I mean, I love DeFi because of the transparency. You know, that said, you know, even if you understand and have a deep technical knowledge and can read the smart contracts and understand exactly how they work, again, given all the interdependencies, it's really hard to understand all the different poten potential scenarios and, and what the real risks are. So, you know, I love DeFi much more than I love CeFi. Um, you know, uh, uh, but even DeFi has its risk, and I think CeFi uh, a, a lot more risks. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think someone the other day was saying something about how DeFi, it's more of a technological risk, maybe smart contracts, but in terms of CeFi, there is some ethical risk or some default risk, depending on how they're managing the money, because we don't know what's being done with our money. So uh, those are really interesting points. But do you think DeFi yeah. would be... Well, and, yeah. and, and let me just say also, from a CeFi risk standpoint, um, you know, I'm in the process of getting divorced, uh, uh, you know, after a, a, a pretty long marriage, and I don't blame my wife for wanting to divorce me. Um, but, you know, it, this is a lawsuit. And the first thing that, you know, that a lawyer will do, um, you know, on the other side is literally, I had all my assets locked up, they were all centralized. So I had worked literally, you know, my whole life over 30 years, I had worked and still you know, and had, you know, assets that I no longer had any access to because they were centralized. So this idea, and again, you know, most people aren't really worried about it because most people say, oh, you know, I'm not a criminal. I don't have to worry about it. Well, turns out you don't have to be a criminal uh, uh, to have all your assets locked up. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good example. I hadn't thought about it from, from that lens. Very, very cool. So do you think eventually DeFi will be able to be its own phenomenon or will it kind of be a combination you know, kind of the best of both worlds supporting each other. Uh, because as you know, you know, as of today, DeFi, it's lacking in terms of liquidity, in terms of execution speed compared to trading systems in the traditional financial world. It's, it's also lacking in terms of fiat on and off ramps because, you know, banks do not want to do uh, business with these type of platforms. But do you think DeFi will live by itself or there will be a combination at one point? Sure. Well, I'm a big believer in something called the Mare's Law, which uh, he was a professor at Stanford in the early 70s when he coined it. And it's the law that says that the impact of all great new technology, and I think DeFi is great new technology, is overestimated in the short run and underestimated in the long run. And I have, you know, in my view, this is a thing. This is going to be a new massive asset class, you know, not different than, you know, new asset classes, you know, come, come along, you know, all the time. Um, it doesn't mean that they replace the old asset classes overnight. If you take a look at um, internet uh, e-commerce, for example, um, you know, before COVID, you know, Amazon had been around 25 years and, you know, massive, massive, massive success. And yet all of the e-commerce, including Amazon, was only about 12% of all, uh, of, of, of all retail. So, uh, and that's after 25 years. So these new things come along um, and they can go like this for a long, long time um, and, uh, and still coexist with everything that coexisted before. Uh, very nicely put. Thank you so much for that, Lou. And there's another topic that I know you're extremely passionate about, and that is stable coins. And obviously, stable coins is also an element. It's actually, it was the biggest driver for DeFi in the beginning with the multi-collateral DAI and MakerDAO. Uh, but we also have centralized uh, stable coins like Coinbase, USDC. Uh, can you give us a little bit of, of your thoughts about stable coins? Because I know that you're extremely passionate about this topic. Sure. So, you know, one of the amazing statistics few people understand is only uh, uh, three percent of money is actually created by government. The rest is created by banks. And mm -hmm. so um, now for the first time, other people besides the government and banks can create dollars. And in terms of markets, um, in round figures, uh, I think the a conservative estimate is, is there are over $30 trillion in the world today. And dollars is growing, the market is growing like this, demand uh, uh, is off the charts, even though the dollar is still going down, it's still the main global currency. So now the opportunity for anybody um, to, to take an algorithm and be able to create digital dollars, um, I think is, is going to change the world and, you know, uh, to a far greater degree than anybody has 
uh, uh, any understanding of. You know, I think central bank digital currencies might be the you know the the first stable coins that go up and to the right. Uh, it could be Libra. It could be one of other you know a dozen projects that are you know all doing incredibly you know or dozens of projects that are all doing incredibly you know innovative uh, uh, stuff and value added stuff and and what money is going to be and what stable coins are going to be um, what dollars are going to be I think is is going to blow people's minds um, nobody has any idea you know the only thing I know for sure is whatever they're going to be is different than what anybody thinks they're going to be. Very, very cool. And in terms of the dollar, you know, like, as you said, the dollar is going through a weakening point. It's at its biggest low in the past, you know, decade. And uh, there's some issues like, you know, such as Russia and China wanting to abandon the dollar as a global reserve currency. And a lot of people saying that's the reason why gold is pumping. It's because the dollar is plus all the QE, the up to six trillion US dollars of QE this year. There are many factors that are kind of, you know, questioning the power of, of the U.S. dollar are there are these concerns a part of yours as well, or something that you just think is a, is a nice headline for the news? <laughs> sure, no, I I agree with all of those. I think that um, you know, I mean, the problem is is you have to look at it holistically, and you know, to some degree, it's like predicting the weather in a month. You know, nobody had, there are too many factors for us to have any idea what the weather is is going to be. We know what the average is. Um, but you know, we, we don't know where it's going to lie relative to that average, um, you know, with, with any accuracy whatsoever, we can now go out about 10 days and have some accuracy, you know, that said, um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge follower of Ray Dalio's. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what I'm going to say now is just parroting what Ray Dalio, uh, you know, has written about, you know, incredibly eloquently, you know, and that's that, you know, we're, we're in a transition period now where you know empires all have a half-life right and the uk empire had a good run um and that was um you know and then we had the u.s empire and you know looking at you know a broad uh, number of of different kind of macro ways of understanding you know how strong uh, a, a given country is you know economically military wise um you know the the u.s peaked uh, relative to other countries 34 years ago. And now, you know, we're really on the downhill slide of our uh, time as an economic empire and world empire. And China's massively ascending. And, you know, in my view, coronavirus of pandemic is just accelerating uh, dramatically, I think, what was already happening. And so, you know, the U.S. is dollars, uh, place as you know the world's currency, um, you know its days are numbered. Um, you know I'm not saying it's happening tomorrow, next week, or next year, but the writing is on the wall. These um, these are inexorable macro trends uh, that are going to continue. And you know the the American exceptionalism. You know I grew up believing in American exceptionalism. What Trump taught me is is that was total bullshit. There's no such thing as American exceptionalism. We're not better than anybody else. We're the same fucking banana republic as every other goddamn country in the world. And that makes a lot more sense, right? Who are we, the United States, to be special? And it's fine that we're going like that. You know what? You know, that's what empires do. We can deal with that. We can still be a great country if we wake up and admit that. But one of the things we're going to have to deal with that's going to have very traumatic impact is the fact that the dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency. And right now we're in a place where we can make and create as many dollars as, you know, a, as we want with, with very little effect. Um, you know, we're, we're one of the only countries that can do that. Um, but our power to do that, I think is, is going to erode over time. And again, that's going to have very negative impacts uh, uh, for, for us as a country and, and for the value of the dollar. Wow. Lou, I have goosebumps. Literally. That was such a beautiful speech right there. I think that's going to go in some sort of highlight. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Ray Dalio is definitely an amazing person. His book Principles is absolutely awesome. Um, and so that, that leads me to a question, which is really interesting because so we're talking about the CBDCs, but uh, we know that, you know, some of the biggest, you know, uh, including the US dollar, the British pound, uh, a lot of these um, so, so-called currencies or fiat currencies 
uh, may be debased or devalued through the quantitative easing that is happening as of today. So what is the, the best kind of stable coin for you, Lou? Would you like to have a stable coin that's backed by multiple uh, different fiat currencies that's backed by gold, backed by Bitcoin? I know it's a really difficult question, but uh, what kind of stable coin would you like to see or a stable coin 2.0 rather than just a CBDC, for instance? Sure. Well, you know, I think, you know, today, I think the dollar, you know, is still, you know, the, the, the world's currency. Obviously, I'm a massive believer in Bitcoin. You know, I, I'm also a huge believer in gold. I think Bitcoin is gold 2.0. But again, you know, gold isn't going away any more than, uh, uh, you know, than, than Amazon and any e commerce made traditional commerce go away. And so, you know, I think over time what you'll see is stable coins that are a basket of different assets um, that, you know, and, and people can make their own stable coin if they want to based on what, you know, what assets that they want to be uh, uh, aligned with. Um, you know, I, and I, you know, there's so many things going on in this space. Um, you know, this whole idea of, of memes, right? And and um, how important a community is in terms of driving the value of, of assets. I think we're in the early days of, of very, very early days of understanding how to really leverage a community to drive the value of assets. That's really interesting. So you're extremely bullish for Bitcoin with all the current you know, economic crisis and all the current conditions in the world. You're very, very confident about Bitcoin and its future price. Yeah, look, I, I think the biggest risk to Bitcoin uh, is a better Bitcoin. Now, what a better Bitcoin would be, I, I don't know. But you know, I think Bitcoin has a pretty big lead. Um, you know, I don't see any better Bitcoin on the horizon. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I've, I've been a huge believer. Since I saw the crypto light in June 29th, 2017, you know, and I believe more today than I did yesterday. You know, I'm a huge believer in Ethereum um, because of the community and because I see how important community is. And I think Ethereum has their, their community is so much more powerful, so much bigger um, than any other crypto community. That you know, I yeah, you know, and you don't just have to be a little bit bit better than Ethereum. You have to be a lot better than Ethereum mm -hmm. to get that community to move someplace else. Um, so it doesn't mean there's still not you know it's early days. Um, anything can happen. You know, there was a time when you know it looked like AOL was going to own everything or Yahoo was going to be the dominant uh, um, uh, uh, search company. So there's there's nothing constant but change. But right now. Uh, there is nothing that I see in the rearview mirror that's going to give Bitcoin or Ethereum a run for their money. Yeah, that's really interesting. And when comparing Bitcoin and gold, especially the market cap, we know that gold's market cap is ten trillion dollars, while Bitcoin is only two hundred to three hundred billion dollars. Meaning that Bitcoin's market cap is only one point six percent relative to gold's market cap. But on top of that, you know, Bitcoin trading volume since twenty sixteen has done over fifty x. So are these indicators to you some of the most bullish indicators in terms of Bitcoin's price and growth in the future? Yeah, I think that's the only way that I know how to put this into context, right? What can it be, right? So the question, I mean, the, the big question is, okay, that's what the market is today, um, you know, for essentially a stable coin. Gold is like the world's first stable coin. Um, and so, you know, and, and Bitcoin, um, you know, I, I think over time, you know, will, you know, will, will, will take on, you know, right now there's a lot more speculation uh, in Bitcoin and that's what's driving the trading relative to, to, to gold. Um, but the idea is, is you want something that's going to hold value relative to everything else. And we know every currency does that um, except gold. If you think of that, it's not a currency, obviously, but gold is the only thing that it's held value over time. And now we have a second thing that I think, you know, has all of the elements, all of the properties that you need um, that gold has, plus a bunch that gold doesn't have. That's why it's gold 2.0. And so over time, right, also where I, I think, you know, the question is how big is that market going to get? How big now that there's a better gold, you know, what is that going to do to that market that was, you know, uh, the store of value market? Um, you know, which I think is just another way of saying stable coin.
Um, and so, you know, you know, does it go from 10 trillion to 20 trillion to 50 trillion to 100 trillion? Uh, nobody has any idea. But, you know, whatever happens to it, I think every day, you know, for the next, you know, 20, 50 years, who knows, uh, a Bitcoin is going to get a larger and larger share of that uh, a store of value market. Very well put. Yeah. And just for those watching out there, so I'm just confirming the numbers. So Bitcoin is currently 1.62% only of gold's market cap. So not even 2% of gold's market cap. And we can also see here that uh, Bitcoin trading volume has grown 50x uh, uh, in the in the past years. So uh, th these are quite bullish signs in terms of Bitcoin itself. Are there any other things that you're really excited about, Lou, this year upcoming in the, the second half of 2020 or 2021 or even further because you're such a visionary you already had that social network model in your mind before facebook did so really could you just uh bring us to the future if we could jump into delorean and you can show us some glimpses of the future that would be great <laughs> yeah um well uh, yeah alex thanks for the kind words but in all sincerity i actually don't consider myself a, a futurist or a visionary you know what i'm very good at is uh looking at early trends and understanding, um, you know, if, if they're going to continue along that trajectory or, or making a good guess, because obviously nobody uh, uh, has a crystal ball. And if I look at the other things today that are in the very early stages of going up and to the right like that, um, you know, one of the areas I'm most excited about is personal tokens or, or social money. Um, so if you think things like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Alex coin or uh, the Karma Dow. Um, where you can actually, again, it's about getting a community together um, around some common goal and create, creating, you know, incentivization mechanisms for those communities um, to continue to add value to the community. And it's important when you say the word community, what does community mean? To me, what community means is, is an ecosystem where everybody gets more out of it than they put in. So it's really magical. Right. And, you know, and I think we're in, again, in the very, very early stages of creating these ecosystems and building out the tool sets to create that at scale. Um, and, and I think you're going to see a lot of innovation in that personal token social money space. I love it. I love that. And I think really it's exactly what you're saying. You know, I think that this whole community centric really is the future, as you're saying, because, you know, obviously the shareholder centric world VC centric world um, has been working up to now. But, you know, if you really want to create an equitable, fair and inclusive, you know, future of finance, right, it, it has to be the community centric approach, doesn't it? Yeah, look, it's about how do we solve for ourselves, right? We've all grown up living in a world where we have to deal with institutions who are solving for them. Um, and if that meant fucking you, they were fine with that, you know, and then in fact, they have a duty to do that because, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. Um, now we can create, you know, uh, a financial system that solves for us, that solves for the community and different people might want different things and we can be a part of different communities to achieve that. Uh, so well put, Lou. This, this has been really an awesome interview and so many gems. Uh, if we want to follow you, where are you the most active? I know you're active on LinkedIn. The nice thing is I've got an unusual name, Lou Kerner. So I'm at Lou Kerner on Twitter. Um, I, you know, I blog uh, regularly on Medium. Um, you know, I write for myself. I don't know what I think of anything until I read what I've written about it. Um, you know, but, you know, I think if, if it's interesting to me, it's interesting to other people. So, you know, I'm, I've been one of the top uh, 10 most um, influential crypto bloggers on Medium for a couple of years now. Um, uh, so those are the, those are the best places to, you know, to see. I do a, a biweekly show called Stable Coins Are Killing It. Um, so you can see those on uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, but keep them busy. You know, it's it's yeah, I, I've never been more excited about what crypto is going to achieve than I am today because it's just, you know, what's going on in DeFi, what's going on in personal tokens, what's going on in so many other aspects of crypto is just blowing my mind and the world still has no idea. Wow, that was really inspiring. Thank you so much for your time today, Lou. We covered many awesome topics such as DeFi versus CeFi, the risks, decentralized versus centralized lending, stablecoins, stablecoins 2.0, CBDCs, and of course, community versus VC shareholder centric 
philosophy. So thank you so much for your time today. We really had a blast having you. Thanks, Alex. And for all those watching out there, don't forget to like, comment, and blast that bell notification. And we'll try to get back to you with an answer as soon as possible. And join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock BST. See you next week, guys. Bye.